This video is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers whose mission is to tell great stories that have defined the human experience. Sometimes a painting arrives at the studio for conservation, and upon first glance I have to wonder, what am I thinking? Is this painting a goner? Can it be saved? Should it be saved? Well, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. And this painting is no exception, though the damage is impressive. Flaking throughout and very unstable, there are signs of very bad conservation attempts in the past. The painting is also extremely dirty. There is a heavy layer of discolored varnish, surface grime, and underneath all of that, lots and lots of overpaint. Did I mention that the paint is unstable? Well, it's so unstable that handling it results in it chipping off. And on top of it all, well, this painting has been lined to a new piece of canvas, of course. And so dealing with this piece is going to be complicated. How will I begin to handle it? How will I remove all of the grime, the varnish, the overpaint, stabilize it, and then finally figure out what actually lies beneath and find a way to put it all back together? Well, that's the challenge for this painting. And I'm excited for it. I like a challenge. Now, if I look at the painting under UV light, we can see this green haze. That's old varnish. And on top of it, these dark areas, well, that's retouching that's on top of the old varnish. Now, circled in red are lighter areas. That's old retouching underneath the varnish. And these green areas, well, I think that's glue that was applied atop everything. So, you can see there is a lot of stuff hidden that needs to come off. But I think the painting is worth it. It's a portrait of the French Countess Marguerite Salmon the lady of the manor. Now among many things, France is known for its beautiful chateaus and manors, like the one our countess resided in. In fact, the Tour de France is one of the most widely viewed programs not because of the bicycle racing, but because of the overhead shots of the beautiful French countryside. And if that's something that's all interesting to you, I would suggest Magellan TV's France from Above, a 10-part series showcasing the bustling cities of Paris and Marseille to the coveted wine countries of Burgundy and Bordeaux, the historic beaches of Normandy and more. France from Above is a tour of the country from the comfort of your own home. Head over to try.magellantv.com slash baumgartnerrestoration or click the link in the description below to take advantage of this offer and try something different. From the beautiful beaches and vineyards of France, we now transition to fish gelatin. I'm taking these sheets of dried fish gelatin and melting them down in some water to create a fish gel adhesive. And this is going to be used in the facing process, the first step in conserving this beautiful painting. Once this fish gelatin has melted, I can go to my flat file and get a few sheets of washi kozo, that beautiful Japanese mulberry paper, and head over to the painting where I'll begin to face it. Now, the facing process is critically important in this painting's conservation because it is so fragile. And we saw just a minute ago, the paint is bubbling up and lifting off. And if I were to try to remove this painting from the stretcher or even clean it or really handle it in any way, shape, or form without facing it, well, the losses would be even more extreme. So a thin coating of fish gelatin on the painting I lay the washi kozo down and then use just a little bit more adhesive to penetrate through the washi kozo and make sure that this beautiful paper bonds to the entire surface of the painting. Now washi kozo is incredibly strong but very flexible and when wetted with this fish gelatin it conforms to the surface and so it will wrap around over and 
all of the little nooks and crannies of the flaking and bubbling paint. And when it dries, it will be incredibly stiff and rigid, and make sure that none of that paint flakes off as I handle the painting. There are many different types of adhesive and many different types of paper that can be used, from washi kozo from Japan to kanji from Korea. And as it dries, we say goodbye to our countess. We'll see her again later. Once the adhesive has been allowed to dry over the course of a full day, I can begin taking this canvas off the stretcher. I'll trim off the extra paper because it just gets in the way if I don't, and then I can begin pulling some of these tacks from this stretcher. Many of these are rusted in, and I suspect that's because of the old rabbit skin glue lining. You see, rabbit skin glue contains water, and if that water gets on the tacks, they generally rust, and that makes removing them a little bit more difficult. Luckily, most of this area that I'm pulling the tacks from is actually the lining canvas. Much of the original canvas tacking edge was lost, and well, that is what it is. So with all of the tacks removed, I can take the painting off from this stretcher. Actually, it's a strainer, and we'll revisit this topic in a little bit. But for now, let's focus on the painting. Now, the first thing that I want to do is get this old lining off so that I can start thinking about how I'm going to put the painting back together. And I know that this is a rabbit skin glue lining. I've made some tests, but I don't know how easily it's going to come off. So I start in a corner where the canvas has already started to separate, and my hope is that I can just peel this right off. That the adhesive has failed enough that it doesn't have a strong bond, and that the lining canvas will come off in one big beautiful sheet. But as I'm checking it out, well, I don't think that that's going to be the case. Yes, the old adhesive is incredibly deteriorated and not really doing much to hold the canvas on. But the canvas is also incredibly deteriorated. It is so dry and so brittle that it breaks apart as I'm trying to remove it. And so pulling it off in one fell swoop, well, that is not in the cards. But it does appear that I can get it off, like peeling an apple. Now. I have scraped a lot of canvases and removed a lot of old linings. And I will tell you that the satisfaction I get when this occurs is second only to pulling it off in one fell swoop. Being able to glide the scalpel blade underneath the canvas and have it peel off in these little strips, while not as fast as pulling it all off in one motion, it is incredibly rewarding. I'm even a little shocked that I'm able to do this, because from my initial tests, I thought that this canvas was just going to crumble apart. But muscle memory and patience and holding my breath and saying a little prayer each time I go across the canvas, well, it looks like it's working. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. If I had to chip this off one centimeter at a time, well, I'd do it, that's my job, and it wouldn't be any different than I'm doing now, at least the outcome. But the process certainly wouldn't be as rewarding. So with all of this canvas off of the original, I can now get to removing that old adhesive. And we know how this goes. My days of scraping are not over. But at least this went well, right? So maybe that's going to portend good things for the removal of the glue. Fingers crossed. Now, normally I would start scraping off all that glue, and that's probably what you were expecting. But remember how fragile that paint layer was? Well, imagine if I started scraping that canvas really aggressively to get all that glue off. What do you think would happen to all of that paint? Well, where it wasn't flaking, it would flake. And where it flaked, it would turn into dust. So I can't remove the glue just yet. I have to do a treatment on the hot table first to at least relax and flatten down some of that flaking paint. Now we know on the hot table, the application of moisture, heat, and pressure will soften the canvas. 
but it will also soften and reactivate any sizing that's in that canvas. And that sizing can be used to at least temporarily bond some of that flaking and lifting paint back down to the canvas. It's not permanent, and I'll have to do another treatment to rectify it permanently, but for now, it works. So after the painting has been brought up to temperature, I've used some tools to encourage the paint to go flat, and then it's cooled, I can remove it from this Mylar envelope and transfer it over to another table where it will dry further and acclimate to my studio. If I were to just start working on this painting right now, well, any residual moisture that's trapped in this canvas was, would cause it to distort radically. It would cup, it would curl, and all of that movement would cause the paint to flake once again, because paint really isn't all that flexible. A little bit, but not as much as canvas. So onto the other table, a piece of felt on the surface to protect the painting and conform to the impasto. Down comes another layer of gypsum board and a cinder block, and that's it. Now, the painting rests under that weight for a couple of days, and I may come and check on it and change out the blotter paper or felt if I feel it's necessary, but eventually it will acclimate to my studio's humidity, and then I can remove it and begin taking off all of this rabbit skin glue. Now, I'm using a tried and tested method here. This is a gelled water. I know that sounds really weird, but this is a synthetic clay that absorbs, oh, about 10 times its weight in water. And when it does, it swells up and creates a gel. I can then paint that gel onto the surface of the adhesive, and it will swell the adhesive. Rabbit skin glue is hygroscopic, meaning that it will absorb moisture. And when it absorbs that moisture from the gel, it gets soft. And when it's soft, I can scrape it. Now the scraping process is one that depends upon extreme focus, attention to detail, practice, and muscle memory. It's not something one picks up right away, and to do it fast and fluidly as I'm working here, well, let's just say that I've been doing this for 20 some odd years, and I actually shudder to think how many hours of my life has spent scraping glue off of the back of canvas. But you can see, once the glue is removed, we have an actually pretty nice canvas. I don't see many signs of deterioration or holes or tears or anything that would warrant the glue lining. I suspect the lining was done in an attempt to stabilize the painting during the beginning signs of flaking, but that's not how we rectify unstable paint. In fact, one could argue that the lining may have just hastened the flaking. Now, how to scrape is a question I get asked a lot, and it really depends upon the way that you hold the scalpel, the angle of the blade, how sharp the scalpel is, and what part of the blade is gliding over the surface. And with every stroke, I am modulating the angle, the pressure, and what part of the blade is touching the canvas. I want to make sure that it glides across the surface without catching on the canvas, that it doesn't cut the canvas, and it just slices off all of the glue. Again, practice and muscle memory. But eventually, I do complete all of the scraping, and I can wipe off the canvas and get rid of all this disgusting rabbit skin glue. And now with the canvas free of rabbit skin glue and exposed, I can start preparing it for some treatments that will rectify the flaking. Now here I am rolling on an adhesive onto a PET film in preparation for an interleaved lining. Wait, a lining? I just said that a lining wasn't necessary and that this canvas wasn't damaged, so what is going on here? Well, you remember back when I said we had a strainer instead of a stretcher? Yeah, well, I recommended to the client that we replace that strainer with a proper stretcher. You see, that strainer is not original to this painting, and it is, well, kind of inadequate. It's just a strainer. Now, the client said that they wanted to keep it. There was some chalk writing on the back that they felt was important. I mentioned that we could salvage that chalk writing and that we should really use a stretcher. But you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink and the client wins because that's the nature of being in private conservation practice. So, I'm doing an interleaf lining, 
because I have to keep the old strainer. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on when we get to the stretching process. Now any interleafed, or regular lining for that matter, begins with a substrate. And in this case I'm using Belgian linen, but one could choose synthetic sailcloth, cotton canvas, really any support. And what one chooses is really informed by their own personal desires and by their experience. And I like Belgian linen. Other conservators may disagree and they can do as they please in their studios, but here we use Belgian linen. Now instead of measuring, I'm just gonna take the strainer and use it as a template and some chalk marks to rough out the canvas. I don't need to be super precise here. I will trim it later on. I just need to get a rough shape. Once that shape is cut out, I will take a piece of adhesive film that I have trimmed and I will put it onto that canvas. Now this adhesive film comes with two release layers, a paper one that I just peeled off and another mylar one onto which I'm ironing right now. I will iron this onto the canvas using a Union Jack pattern going from the center out to make sure that any ripples and waves are eliminated. If I get creases or ripples or bubbles, they can transfer to the painting. I've cut down that piece of PET film that I put the adhesive on earlier, and I'm aligning it with the canvas now. Once it's where I want it, I will take the iron and a piece of release film and just tack the corners so that it doesn't move during handling. The last thing I want is this thing to shift and then have to undo all of my work just to do it again. And finally, I will assemble the sandwich. New canvas on the bottom, adhesive film, PET film, and then old canvas. I'll make sure it's aligned, and then again, once I have it where I want it, I will take my iron and I will tack the corners just to make sure it doesn't move. Now, the walk from this table to the hot table is fairly short, but any shift will be seriously problematic. And once I have started the process, I can't really stop. So back to the hot table where I have already started heating it up. It takes a little bit longer to bring it up to the temperature needed to activate the adhesive film. And I will wrap the perimeter of this canvas with some cotton webbing. And this cotton webbing just facilitates the extraction of the air with the vacuum pump. Now once it goes all the way around and I have enough that I'm confident all of the air will be removed, I can start covering this with the mylar that I use to create the vacuum envelope. I have to remember to put these little through bag connectors in place now. I've forgotten in the past and it's a royal pain. Now on top of this, I'm also putting a layer of release film just in case any of the adhesive squeezes through. I don't want anything sticking to this painting. I will add the through bag connectors, which are aligned on the webbing, and then I'll turn on the vacuum pump. And the through bag connectors will facilitate the vacuum pump's extraction of the air along the cotton webbing, and then we will have even pressure on the entire surface of the painting. The hot table's hot now, so I'm gonna use a piece of felt running over the surface. Now the process of cooling the hot table takes a few hours, but once it's done, I can remove the painting from the hot table and begin removing the facing. Now remember, we used a fish gelatin, and it's water-based, so I can add some water to the face of this painting. It will swell that fish gelatin, which is also hygroscopic, just like the rabbit skin glue. It will soften, and then I can begin lifting off this washikozo. Now, this washikozo is incredibly strong, and the combination of the fish gelatin, the multiple heat cycles, and the vacuum pressure down on it has caused it to really bond to this painting. And so it's a little bit more difficult to remove than in some of the other cases. And that's okay, it will come off eventually, but it always heartens me to see just how well it has bonded to the surface of this painting, and how as I'm removing it, no paint is coming up. Remember just how flaking that painting was. Just how tenuous some of that paint was on the canvas. Well, none of it has been lost. Not a single bit. 
It really is a testament to both the adhesive quality of the fish gelatin and the washikozo. Beautiful materials, really. And now I can begin surface cleaning this painting. And this is necessary to A, remove any of the remnants of the fish gelatin, and also get off any of the surface grime from the painting. Now, one of the great benefits of using fish gelatin and washikozo is that it will pull off lots of the surface grime, so there isn't a ton on this painting. But remember, I do have to remove it because if I don't, it complicates the process of removing any of that old varnish. You see, what removes this surface grime isn't what removes varnish, and vice versa. So we have to separate those two so that we can use the appropriate solutions or solvents or just general approaches to getting them off. You can see some of those lines. Well, that is some old fish gelatin still stuck on the surface. And when I clean it off, well, it will be cleaned off. And then I'll be ready to start removing all of this old varnish, all of this old overpainting, more varnish, more overpainting. You know the drill. You've been here before. And I'm going to roll my own swab here. And the function of these little rolled swabs on a stick is to give the conservator a little bit more control. We can see what we're removing a little bit better if our big clunky hands aren't in the way. Now, we could use store-bought swabs, but that would take forever, and it's not actually any more efficient. Sometimes I can just use a cotton ball with my hand if I don't need to see what I'm doing in such great detail, and there are instances where that is okay. Now, because this painting has been worked on many, many times, I do want to see precisely what I'm removing so that I have a better understanding of what's original and what isn't and what I will need to remove again later on. And just with the first pass, you can see just how dirty this painting is. The varnish is very yellowed, and some of the old overpainting is coming up too, which is actually great. Sometimes the overpainting was done on top of a layer of varnish deliberately, sometimes not deliberately. Sometimes they didn't clean the painting before they started retouching it. And that actually works to the conservator's benefit because the overpainting is generally harder to remove than the varnish. But if the varnish is under the overpainting, well, we can just remove the varnish and the overpainting will come off with it. Does that make sense? I think it does. As I begin to clean various parts of this painting, well, I'm getting a better understanding of just how broad of a palette the artist used. There are a lot of colors on this canvas, and Frankly, right now, they all kind of look yellow. That's because the varnish has yellowed over time. These natural resins, in this case a damar from a tree in Southeast Asia, has oxidized and discolored over time. UV light has really done damage to it. And when it gets corrupted, well, it kind of turns yellow. And removing it, well, reveals a whole world of color. It is always exciting for me to clean the face of a painting. Obviously, this is the most important part of the painting, the thing that we are looking at first. And so to see what's truly underneath this old, dirty varnish, well, it's always exciting. Flesh tones respond wonderfully to cleaning. They are bright, they are full of life, they're rich, they're seductive. And the old natural varnish, once yellowed, well, it flattens them, aside from making people look jaundiced and aged. It just makes them look less lively, makes them look less like people. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody but me, but once paintings are cleaned and we can see the true faces, I get the feeling that the people look happier. They look more alive. They look more vibrant. They probably look how they wanted to be looked at, and how the artist wanted them to appear when they painted the painting. Now, no artist puts a varnish on their painting knowing that it's going to deteriorate. And historically, there weren't many options for artists, and they were all natural resins. And so an artist would choose a varnish, put it on, not knowing that in 50 or 100 years it would have corrupted the painting so thoroughly that we wouldn't be able to see what it looked like. But that's the case. 
And so when we remove this varnish, we're not removing a patina. We're not removing a warm glow from the painting. What we're doing is removing something that has failed, that was out of the control of the artist. We're returning the painting to what the artist saw when they decided that the painting was complete. And that's part of the job of the conservator, not just to stabilize flaking and chipping paintings and to make sure that they last for another generation or 10, but it's also to try to get the artist's vision back so that we can appreciate their skill and their talent and the art that they have created for us. I don't know any artist that would balk at that and say, well, I liked that old varnish, keep it there. Now underneath this old varnish was a layer of surface grime. I noticed it as I was cleaning, that the painting wasn't coming up as much as I expected. That is, the skin tones were still quite dirty and dulled. Well, whomever worked on this painting just didn't clean it properly. They just threw on another coat of varnish to make it shiny or look better. And so now I'm going to remove that layer of surface grime that was underneath the varnish. And when I do so, well, we're going to actually see what the artist wanted us to see. Big, big difference. And this is one of the main differences between conservators and people who are not conservators. Conservators don't put varnish over surface grime. We remove the surface grime before we varnish paintings. And so it tells me that whomever worked on this painting was not a conservator. Maybe they fancied themselves a conservator. Maybe they knew a little bit about conservation. But knowing a little bit, well, you know that saying about a little bit of knowledge makes you, oh, just a little bit dangerous. Well, it's true here too. It would have been better had they never touched this painting. It would require less work by me, less exposure to solvents, less handling, less everything. But it is what it is. And luckily, I've seen this before, so I know how to correct it. Now, as we come to the eyes, we can see the difference between the skin that was cleaned and the skin that wasn't. We can also see some of the excessive discolored overpainting that is on the surface of the painting. And this was done to correct this little tear or this area of paint loss above her brow, but you can see that there is a lot of it and it is very discolored. Now, whether it discolored because it was put on old varnish and the color was matched to a dirty painting or because it discolored over time as the paint changed and oxidized. I can't be certain. But either way, it's got to go. And so as I wrap up the cleaning of these eyes, that's what I'm thinking about next. Now, removing old overpaint is always a tricky and delicate procedure, for we never know if it's going to come off easily or fight you tooth and nail. I'm applying a gelled solvent mixture to the area of the overpaint, but carefully so, because this solvent mixture is indiscriminate. It doesn't care if it's on overpaint or original paint. It will start to break down whatever it comes into contact with, and so I have to be careful where I place it. But babysitting it, and once I'm certain that I've softened up the overpaint enough, but not started to attack the original paint, I can remove that overpaint. And you can see, underneath that overpaint, <laughs> there's surface grime. The painting was never cleaned before they retouched it, but I'm not surprised. So I will remove all of that surface grime, and once I do so, we will start to see, again, the original paint underneath all of this overpaint. Now, on top of all of the overpaint and surface grime needing to be removed, all of this old fill-in has to come off too, because I have a sneaking suspicion that it also was not done very well. And my suspicions are confirmed, because as I remove it, I am seeing original paint underneath the fill-in medium, and that's not something that we want. We just want to replace where the paint is missing, 
not to cover up the original, like was done here. So I have a lot of scraping ahead of me. There was a lot of fill in on this painting. Throughout the painting, large swaths were just covered by fill in medium. So I'll spend a couple of hours over the course of a couple of days scraping, taking a break, scraping some more. And while I do that, I can only think that eventually underneath all of this, we'll have something worth saving. And join me for part two, where we'll do that saving.